Welcome to Clear Eyes, Full Hearts, a podcast presentation of Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. This is an episode-by-episode look at the award-winning TV show Friday Night Lights, created by Peter Berg. I'm Stacey Oristano. I played Mindy Collette Riggins. And I'm Derek Phillips, and I played Billy Riggs. The assumption is that you, our listeners, have already watched the show. But if you haven't already, go watch Friday Night Lights, which is currently streaming on Netflix and Peacock TV, because there will be spoilers in our podcast. If you want to support our show, subscribe for free to our new YouTube channel where you can access exclusive content. We have a YouTube handle that makes it easy to find us. That's youtube.com slash at Clear Eyes Full Hearts. Also, we are continuing to release new episodes of the podcast every other week. That's right. So join us as we recap all your favorite episodes and chat with amazing guests. And answer your questions. Email us what you want to know at clearizefullheartspod at gmail.com today. We are talking about Season 5, Episode 7, Perfect Record. It was written by Eaton Frankel and Derek Santos Olson and directed by Adam Davidson. Here is our NBC synopsis. A website creates controversy for the Lions during Rivalry Week, and Vince gets caught in a power struggle between his father and Coach Taylor. We have the one and only Matt Loria, a.k.a. Luke Caffrey, joining us today. But before we talk to Matt, let's recap this episode. We'll be here all night. Those boys came out on that field with tents and guns and I'm assuming a bunch of beer and you know that there's going to be no toothpicks on the Lions field. Yeah, I really love that Buddy and the rest of the East Dillon boosters are out there protecting the field. And yeah, of course, Stacey, it's Texas. So somebody's got to have a shotgun. I mean, it's aggressive. It's aggressive. I'm with Coach. I don't know, Stacey. you got to protect the field at all costs. Like, it's not enough that there's 20 guys there. You also <laughs> need to put the shotgun away. Ugh. Okay, I had no idea. Literally shocked. I had no idea we were going to see Jason Street in this episode, and it wasn't even, like, a buildup. It's just his face was on my TV. Yeah, it's crazy. I love the way that they shot it, too. I knew he was going to pop back up again. I couldn't remember which episode it was. But, yeah, I literally was like... <sighs> I love that there's a woman like sitting in front of the camera who's in the foreground and she just kind of leans back and it's like, bam, there's Jason. Totally unexpected. Totally catches you by surprise. Really nice reveal there. And I mean, it's like seeing an old friend. Yeah, it made me feel warm. Yeah. These last six episodes, we're going to see a lot of FNL alumni pop up here and there. So get ready. But yeah, really great to have Street back. It was great as a cast member to have him back. I remember we were shooting the Kingdom episode when Scott showed up in the town. Mm -hmm, And I got a text message from him at like midnight. And I was like, I got to work tomorrow, but I could probably meet Scott out for one, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, one turned into about 31. Mm -hmm. That's not really something I want to talk about. So I'll save that for another time. But I would also like to say like, I get it. Planting little seeds of like, Maybe bigger things for Coach. Like, people are talking about Coach. I will say this about my night out with Scott, because it was one of those (laughs) nights. (laughs) And I can't shut up. That's my problem. It was one of those epic evenings where when I showed up to set the next day, Kyle Chandler goes, what's wrong with you? It was one of those. But it works for Billy, man. So it's like It does work for Billy. That was the problem with Billy. totally great. All right. I would like to say I do do you not think you're allowed to talk about a juvenile's record on the radio and before you say it Derek I'm gonna shout out Devil Town I know yeah you're not supposed to talk about a juvenile's record on the radio for sure and you know I used to like Slam and Sammy Mead but this is kind of across the line here Slam and Sammy um... it also makes me hate the Panthers even more because you know that this story came from them 100% it's just so mean he's a kid terrible stuff and then there were those people in the stands that were wearing, like, prison uniforms. Like, oh, yeah. calm down. Calm yeah. down, Selen. If you're going to be here in this house is a line that Tammy says to Julie. And all I want to say is, why is she there in that house? You need to go back to school and deal with your actions and be an adult. Just not an adult. I get it. But no, I'm, I agree. I'm over it. Stacy, this is one of those very rare instances on this show where I actually agree with you about something. We are 100% in the same boat. Julie is getting on my last nerve here. Yeah, man. And now, I just want to be clear, that's not a slight on Amy Teagarden. She's doing a fantastic job of playing one of the more, I don't know, annoying characters on Friday Night Lights this season. Yeah. But she's doing a great job at annoying the hell out of me. Like, go back to school. Yeah, seriously, get it together, kid. 
Who called me Mrs. Riggins? And it's definitely the first time that's ever been said on the show. I think it is. It felt very weird and it made me feel very old. That's your name. I know, and he's so You don't polite. like the name Riggins at the end? You want to still be a Now it's the miss, it's the mill. Like, everyone just says Mins, Mindy. He's so polite. So, of course, yes. Luke would say that, but it like makes my skin crawl. I still feel that way. I'm 47 years old, and when someone calls me Mr. Phillips, it just feels uh -uh. like awkward and weird. I don't like it. I don't take to it very well. Also, I begged you. I begged you to come to the champagne room with me. Yeah, you think that that's not true? You think that Billy's making this up? It's just I have never seen this episode. I did not read the script. I have never heard that story before until well, yeah. now. You should know this because it informs your character, so yes. Does it? Does it? Or is Billy talking? Yeah, I think it may just be Billy talking. It may... There was a lot of improv in that scene. I could tell. That, I'm pretty sure, was scripted. God, I gotta say, I really love shooting this scene and all the scenes that I got to have with Matt Laurie. It was always fun because the two of us played off each other pretty well. But yeah, we had a good time shooting this. We're going to have him a little later on in the podcast, so stick around. Huh, today. That's right. Yeah, you guys are fun together in the backyard. Yeah, we had a good time. Okay, there's this scene with Vince and his father. And I actually asked myself this question, like, what is it about fathers and sons? Because it's like Field of Dreams gets me. Cats in the Cradle gets me. The scene with Vince and his dad gets me. I am neither a father nor a son. Those stories, like, kill me. Yeah, I mean, me too. I think maybe because, you know, men have such a difficult time relating to each other emotionally. So when you actually see these scenes, you're not used to it in everyday life, you know? Yeah. My dad and I talk about a lot of things. I don't know that we ever have, like, heart-to-hearts like this, though, you know? Yeah. Do women? Yes. I don't have any sisters. I call my mom for everything. Yeah. I mean, I call my dad for everything, too, but, like, stupid stuff, like... You're watching this baseball game. Do you see this play? Blah, 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 blah. But not, you know. Almost everyone I know, when we like either went to college or moved into our first place, we had the call home where we had to ask our mom how to boil an egg, which probably seems like the easiest thing in the world, but I'd never done it because she did it for me. So I had to find out how to cook a baked potato because I didn't know <laughs> and how to boil an egg. And I definitely, I needed her. Yeah, I had to call home to ask my dad how he made his French toast. I don't think I've ever been more disappointed in my life. With your French toast? Because he's like, all right, what you're going to do is you're going to take some bread. And I go, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I got notes. I'm like writing this down. And he goes, mm -hmm. take some bread. And you take some eggs. And you mix them together. And then you pour it on the bread. And I go, okay. And he goes, and then you throw it on the grill. Go put a little cinnamon on there. No, my dad doesn't do anything. We just drowned it in syrup, you know? That's why it was so good. It's the butter and syrup on top. That's yeah, what makes it. But I thought that there was some special thing. I should have known that my dad, who's never really stepped foot in the kitchen except to make French toast, probably was not going to pull out some kind of Gordon Ramsay thing. But listen, Godspeed to the first person who looked at a piece of bread and said, I'm going to dip that in egg and I'm going to put it in a pan. Yeah. Godspeed to you, whoever you are. Thank you for your service. I've always thought about that guy who found those things because he had to try a lot of terrible stuff too. He probably ate some like cat poop first and was like, that's not good. That's not good. I think yeah. about the guy that first drank milk from a cow. Like yeah. that, he did that and said, I, I want to put that in my mouth. There's like 30 other dudes standing around watching. You know what I mean? Like, so what, you know, is it oh poison? My God. Nobody knows what it is. We don't know if it's going to be okay. And then he, he comes out, you know, covered in froth, frothy milky lips. Just guys, it's like, not so bad. Not so bad, guys. Feel a bit yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of drinking. Yes. Guys, new new drinking game on Friday Night Lights. Drink anytime our son, Stevie Hannibal Riggins, is crying. Nobody will survive. Yeah. I mean, in Stevie's defense... It was hot as hell out there, and, like, I'm screaming the whole time. You are yelling in his ear. I'm screaming in his ear while it's hot as hell outside, <laughs> and I'm like, I've never felt worse in a scene for, like, my scene partner. And my <laughs> scene partner is this little baby, and they had to swap him and his brother out, and I just mm -hmm. was like, we got to hurry through this, guys, because I feel like I'm literally traumatizing these kids for life. Oh, we probably did. I'm probably going to have to call their mom and have a sit down and, and make sure those kids are okay. Those were like formative okay. years that we had them and we were, yeah. oh God, we I feel bad. We those poor children. <laughs> Bima, and another thing in that scene, Matt had to drink that gross, gross drink multiple times. It was so now, gross. In, in all fairness, it was his concoction. He came up with it. It was like spinach and yogurt, which is fine, I guess. It's not uh, something that's appetizing to me. But can you imagine having to drink a spinach yogurt drink in 105 degree heat and he was really moving out there like he was really working out it was disgusting and i was just sitting there 
drinking my fake beer going, wow, you're a trooper, man. Oh, okay. No, but I do have to say when he was punching that, like when you got him to like really punch, I was seeing some future signs of Maddie on Kingdom. Where right. He, like, really punches people. Yeah. Good. Oh, uh-huh. yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. You said it was coming. You yeah. said it was coming. You warned me. Vince and Coach are going to have trouble now. Yeah. Vince's dad is in it, man. He's a man with a plan. He is. And things are about to get really nasty. I mean, they get nasty right here. But I just, I got to tell you, I love the way that Kyle and Crest play off of each other in this scene. It's literally like two bulls in a china shop. You're just sitting there like on the edge of your seat. The tension is super, super thick. Two amazing actors just kind of going toe to toe there. They're like both writing the line without going over. And yes. it's like, oh, yeah. oh God. <laughs> totally. It's just a lot of staring in each other's eyes, sizing each other up kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Bow, bow, bow. I would love to do a scene like that. Yeah. If people don't look at me and think that she's scary. I don't get to have many like that, but man, they're fun when you get to. Yeah. Oh, must be nice. <laughs> okay. I did not understand Tammy driving to Julie's college. <laughs> I don't understand why Julie is not having to deal with the problems she made. Tammy has a full-time job, a baby, and a husband, and she went and got like her schoolwork or something. I just, yeah. I don't like it. I'm right there with you as a fan of Tammy, but I do think on a strictly storytelling note, we got to have this really awkward, awesome scene between her and the TA. You know what I mean? Yeah, I get it. I get the setup. Yeah, the setup, I agree that I don't think Tammy would probably do that. You know, the Tammy that we know. But it does make for a really awkward, awkward scene. Yeah. You know, she does justify it a little bit with Coach where it's like, look, this girl's laying around here. She's not doing anything. I'm going to make sure she's getting her schoolwork done at least. You know, I don't know. I don't love it. They're lenient parents. My parents would kick me out of that house yeah. when the game started. Derek's shaking his head at me now, you guys, because I'm about to say something and I'm going to be wrong and I'm fine with it. Do not edit this out. <laughs> I thought Street came out in a jersey and then at the end of the game, he was in a polo. Street showed up to the East still in practice with his jersey on. But when we see him at the game, he's in a polo shirt. I made sure. And yeah, he's wearing the polo shirt the whole time. I promise. It really you. was weird to have him on the Panther side. It was yes. really weird. I get yeah. it. He Street is a Panther. He's right. He yeah. wears blue. I get it. But it was so weird. You know what's weird? My little brother used to coach for a school called Gulliver. And I grew up in Miami. And our arch rival was Gulliver. And so my little brother coached for Gulliver. But I went to school at Westminster. And like mm. that was our arch rival growing up. So it was really hard. When Westminster would play Gulliver, because my heart is saying root for Westminster, but my brother's a coach for Gulliver. That's hard. This game was nasty, and I'm a fan of the nasty games. When he says, that's not how we play, you saw they were mad at you. Yeah, I love when Crowley turns to Billy and says, I am not talking. I am not talking to you. Because he, at one point, Crowley's saying to coach, like, you can't let these kids keep playing like this. They're celebrating after every, it's, it's, it's unsportsmanlike. And it's not Coach Taylor football. And so Crowley's basically calling him out like, Coach, you got to do something. These kids are out of control. The whole team is out of control. And Billy's kind of egging it on and laughing and having a good time and encouraging the behavior. And And Crowley, like, it was kind of crazy because we've said before, like, Tim Crowley's not an actor by trade. He's a professional referee. I'm going to tell you right now, though, when he turned around and said, I am not talking to you, it caught me. I mean, it was... 100% real. And you can see by the expression on my face, I had no clue he was going to react like that. And that's what they call, like in acting, it's a kinesthetic response. It's not premeditated. I wasn't thinking that's how I was going to react. He turned and looked at me and there was an anger in his eyes. And I was like, where did that come from? I love that. I love it. Because it's not, listen, that wasn't necessary for the storyline, but it was like insane. Insanely powerful. But it is necessary for the storyline because I yes, think you're going to see... like you specifically. Yeah, I think you're going to see moving forward, there's kind of a little... It, it, it's not something that, you know, that we go into great detail about, but there is a little bit of a divide now between the coaches. Um, and there becomes, in later episodes, there's going to be a divide between some of the players on East Dillon and other players. And it's also this chasm that's kind of being created between Vince and Coach. Coach, at the end of this game, is pissed off because, you know, he still ends up 24 points with less than 20 seconds left. And Vince decides, instead of taking a knee and ending the game, to drop back and throw a 65-yard bomb 
and run up the score on a team that was already beaten. Mm -hmm. It's beyond unsportsmanlike. It's not cool. It's not a good look. And it's not Coach Taylor football. And Coach is rightfully pissed at the end of the game. And so is Crowley. Coach Crowley's pissed off at the end of the game. It's weird, though, to have that in the locker room after winning a game. Like, yeah. the coaches are right, but it's like, oh, there's no celebration. Yeah. yeah. I liked. Great I liked. episode. And you know what, Stace? You know what time it is? What time is it? Matt Loria time. It's Matt it time. All right, Stacy and I are thrilled to have Dylan's favorite pig farmer, Matt Loria, a.k.a. Luke Cafferty, on the show with us today. Matt has been seen in dozens of films and TV shows, including 30 Rock, Law & Order, Criminal Intent, Lipstick Jungle, The Chicago Code, Burn Notice, Person of Interest, Gilded Lilies, Parenthood, Kingdom, Shaft, Dickinson, Tell Me a Story, Little Birds, Outer Range, 80 for Brady, the Oscar-nominated film To Leslie, and he's currently one of the leads on CBS TV's rebooted CSI Vegas. Matt! Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, man. I appreciate it. There's nothing I would rather be doing right now, <laughs> except for hearing my very first gigs ever, which were even you went you went so deep. You went to the Law and Order and the Thirty Rock. That was my I first did a deep job dive. Ever. Deep you dive, deep, baby. man. Trader wasn't on here, and I legit watched you two nights ago on it. I didn't pick that one up. My bad. And I loved it. You crushed it, Derek. That was amazing. You just made me feel <laughs> fantastic. I'm like, yeah, I've been. I guess I've been doing something for the last 15 years. You've been years. doing something for a few for a few years here. Nothing that has gotten quite the response that Friday Night Lights continues to get. Yeah. That's yeah. for sure. I think that's for all of us, unfortunately. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but before, before we start dragging this train forward, I just want to say, you guys, other than being two of my favorite characters on the show, are two of my favorite people from the show. And from the beginning, we're two of the most embracing and kindest people. I think it was my first week, finished shooting. I, I was still in a little bit of a haze of bewilderment and astonishment. Those are very similar things. And wonder at my fortune of actually being in Dillon, Texas and talking to the inhabitants of Dillon, Texas right in the flesh. And you guys took me and showed me downtown Austin mm -hmm. and we went to a bar and you gave me the skinny on just about everything in town and made me feel really welcome. And my big takeaway from that night was Billy Riggins drives a BMW. <laughs> <laughs> and Billy was a little fancy in his Austin days. Dude, thank, thank you, for, you that. That, for that. I appreciate that. I wish you truth. hadn't said this on our podcast because I do have a reputation to uphold as a jerk. So that kind of blows up my rep. I appreciate it. Of course. I wanted to ask you, so I was doing a little research. You were born in Virginia, correct? That's correct. As far as I can remember. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know this, but did you live in Dublin? I did, man. I, I grew I didn't up. Know this. I was born in Virginia, just outside of DC. Yeah. And I lived there until second grade. And then I moved to Dublin, Ireland. I was there all the way through elementary school and part of middle school until I moved to Orlando, Florida for eighth grade. You wow. lost the accent? I had a thick Dublin accent. Oh, did you really? Like, that would be so oh, absolutely. Cute. Yeah. My sisters and I, it only took about six seven, eight months before we had a substantial accent. And then within a year or so, there was no trace of Americanisms. Because at that age, those are such formative years. And at that age, you're mm -hmm. such a sponge. Yeah. And you're learning so much for the first time. And so the things that we would learn, including spelling or pronunciation or whatever, was always in the Irish, you know, it was the Irish version of it. And then you're socializing. It's the first mm -hmm. time that you're choosing music that you like, that you're choosing the sort of people you want to be around, the activities you want to engage in. And so all of those things were over there in Ireland. And, you know, we weren't really as autonomous at those early ages in America. So, we, yeah, we were thick Dublin accent, little little scrappy Dublin kids. Broke That's crazy, as, man. I broke love as it. thin. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, dude, when did you know you wanted to be an actor? In Dublin, Ireland. So really? my dad was, yeah, my dad was an animator. Animators are, if you took the sort of quirky, nerdy, fantastic imaginations of comic book nerds mm -hmm. and you fuse them with 
actors, that sort of vibrance and curiosity and kind of sense of irony. They're actors with their hands. That was my take on animators. So we had the most colorful upbringing. My dad was an animator. So I wanted to be an animator and I also wanted to be an Olympic sprinter. These were my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Until in Dublin, Ireland, the school required us to audition for the school play. And everybody was, we were all in our uniforms and everybody was trooped into this room and you had to sing something. And I think I sang happy birthday or jingle bells or something because I had never been in front of people performing, never sang. And maybe they felt bad for me or they thought it was adorable just how, you know, terrified I was. And so I got the understudy for the March Hare in the original production. They, they had written music and everything for this original production of Alice in Wonderland. And then before we began rehearsals, the kid got really, really sick. And by the way, I hope he's okay. <laughs> I never got any word on that. He sort of reminded me of the guy from The Simpsons who was sort of pale and yellow and always, well, they were all yellow, weren't they? But he was paler yellow and he was always like barfing on the school trips. Like, <laughs> he had that sort of aspect to him. And I really do hope he's all right. But also, hey man, you could have been here today with Derek and Stacy, and you're not. You know, choices. Thank you know what I mean? Thank choices. Pale boy. <laughs> yeah, we did that play. And we, you know, we got to get off this stupid topic. But, but no, so we, <laughs> we did. So we, we did that. We did that play. And, and then, you know, I just loved being in front of an audience. And I thought, like, this is it for me. This is it. Yeah. I loved it. So I know you went to University of North Carolina School of the Arts. You received a Bachelor of Fine Arts there. For those of you at home listening to the podcast who don't know, UNC is one of the best theater programs in the country. Can you explain how your education helped prepare you for your career? Yeah, 100%. It's worth saying, just for anybody who is interested in spending a lot of money to go to a drama school and then coming out. And, and you know this too, because Derek, and did you go to drama school, Stacey? We all went to drama yeah. school. In right? Cheerio, yeah. London. Yeah. So what it's like to spend a lot of dough getting a degree in drama that ain't going to do a lot of good unless no. you're an actor, you know? <laughs> waiting but tables you, and acting. It did help me get jobs waiting tables, though. I think I got the job waiting tables over the guy who just had a high school degree. I was the worst waiter, by the way. So oh, but, but that's not worth talking about. But, you know, if someone is persuaded, I will, I will say this. I went to like seven years of college total just to get that BFA. I think I like went to one school and left, went to two more. It took me a long time to get that BFA. So it was like the only fancy drama school that accepted me. And I had tried for years. Here's the encouragement that you might need if your parents are telling you you're not selling on that for what it's worth. <laughs> Do you think it helped you when you went in for your Luke Cafferty audition? What did you know about Luke Cafferty oh, yeah. before you got in there? Yeah, I think I credit a huge amount of my success with my training. Yeah. You know, and I had I had a mentor who told me, listen, if you really want to do this, then your acting class once a week, every Wednesday night or whatever, probably ain't going to cut it. Like, if you really want to do this, you should really study the craft. You know, you guys are actors, actors. And but I have some friends that are brilliant mm -hmm. and never trained a day. But for me, for someone as, you know, as, as uh, obtuse as myself, it definitely was necessary. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about what your audition process for Friday Night Lights was like? Yeah, so I had been watching all of you guys for three seasons. Oh, I didn't and know that. yeah, so my manager was like, you have to see this show. And he, who incidentally represents the great guys, Charles, Smash Williams. So he goes, I'm telling you, you got to see this show. The acting is incredible. The storytelling is incredible. And he gives me the DVDs. And for those of you who are listening, a DVD <laughs> is a plastic disc. He gives me the DVDs that I borrow from him. And my wife and I, I was between jobs. I just, I had been on a job in New York that ended. So we were just chilling at her parents' house outside of LA. And we started binging Friday Night Lights and we were halfway through the third season. And from the very first episode, I watched the pilot and I went, damn, I should have been on this show. I was like, mm -hmm. this is everything in the world that I ever wanted to do as far as storytelling. And I was like, I can't believe I missed it by a year because I was still in, still in mm -hmm. school at the time. Yeah. And so I was like, damn, not in a vain way. Like I should have been, no, like, I'm no, so no. amazing. But in a way that I'm like, this is everything I ever wanted to do. So It's rare though, too, as an actor, where you find one of those shows that you love and you're like, man, I would love to be a part of this. And then you actually get an opportunity to be a part of it. Like, I don't dude, think I've ever had that happen. I can't fathom what it feels like. I'm getting chills just thinking about it, guys, because I thought the show was off the air. Because mm -hmm. I, I knew that there was some <laughs> boopity, boopity, boo, and things were jumping around. And then I've got these DVDs, which are, when he gives them to me, pretty worn out, you know, because everybody's <laughs> been borrowing them. So the box is all scuffed up. And I'm like, yeah, this is, this is a show from a handful of years ago. Well, anyway, 
I'm watching it and then I get this audition for the show and I go, you're joke. this can't yeah. be real. And I'm giving away something that I shouldn't hear, but who cares? I find out that it's still on and I have this audition and my manager, I said, I thought it was off the air. And he goes, no. And the audition came up and my agents at the time, I guess we're like, oh, Matt's like 26 years old or he's going to be 26, like oh, he's no. 25 at this point. Right? And they're like, he's not, you know, of course he can't play a high schooler. And my manager was like, no. They're all older than you know, you <laughs> they're all in their forties. Every one of those high school kids is 71. And so, so they were like, all right, well, we'll throw his hat in the ring. And thank goodness he said that. So my audition, I went to Linda Lowy's casting, one of the great, great casting directors ever, a true woman of the craft. And I did my audition. I just remember working on the material and going, oh my God, this is the most important thing I'll ever do. <laughs> <laughs> and running it with my wife incessantly. Back in those days, my wife would run auditions with me. Now she wow. doesn't, and that's better for our relationship. Oh, really? <laughs> so, oh, yeah. You know, I was two years out of school. I was like one and a half years out of school. But now, you know, a good 15 years deep, she's like, absolutely not. Like, you know, it's just too okay. much. Uh, I've had you come over to my place and Jared. help me with an audition or two, and I've definitely helped you with one or two in, in the past. <laughs> All right. Well, the, tr the, the true story there is there's been two pivotal moments where I have called on Derek and they've delivered exceedingly. There's only been two times that I've really been like, yo, man, I, I need your help on this. And one was Kingdom, which was <gasps> oh, some of the wow. most complicated material I'll ever do. That was a show that I did for DirecTV. And it's a very psychological character, a very sort of edgy, sort of very dangerous world, very unknown world to me. And I said, hey, Derek, can we run over this? And he worked the audition for me and I got the job. It's a type of role I'd never played before and it opened a lot of doors for me. You crushed that gig, honestly. Thank that you, was man. really fun to watch the transformation that you made, especially just knowing who you are. I was explaining to Miranda, our producer, before you came on the show today, I'm like, he's like the nicest guy you're ever going to meet. Mm -hmm. Like, And I mean that wholeheartedly. <laughs> and you were playing this, you know, badass MMA fighter on Kingdom, tatted up, you know, guy who kill you in the ring kind of thing. Dude, you just crushed it. And knowing who you Thank are you. it was really fun to watch that transformation thank you man i'm gonna turn it back around we're doing parenthood <laughs> jason games asked me to do parenthood is like a three episode thing and the storyline just was working and it kept going for a while and there's a pivotal moment early in all this where i'm sort of oh, talking about this. yeah and i call derek and i go i've done all my work i've done the research i talked to a bunch of soldiers you know really sussed out a lot of stuff but now we need to really work this emotional piece here that this like background, like family trauma stuff and all this stuff. There's just stuff that I had to kind of work on. And I go, Hey man, can I just call you? Can we just, yeah, we just had a talk in call, character? Right? Like, yeah, I was like, I want to talk. This is like weirdo actor stuff. Can we talk in <laughs> character? Like you'd be my brother. Here's kind of some of the parameters, like, you know, give me a little bit of this and that, whatever. And Derek's like, yeah, sure. He's, he's totally oh, game. <laughs> and we sat there before I'm about to do this big emotional scene. And he and I must have talked for 45 minutes in character as my was older it brother. Right, it was right before you were going to go shoot it? On the day. It was like oh, on the day. Dee? before. Yeah, he did that. The last two jobs I've left, Derek read with me. I'm really not liking this interview today because it's, it's <laughs> you're blowing up my spot, man. I've got yeah. a reputation to uphold as a tough jerk, and you guys yeah, are killing it's me. Not, it's not working. So I do want to ask you, though, because, I mean, I've been a guest star on shows before. I literally have a yeah. recurring role on a show right now. Thank God everyone on it is super lovely. There have been times as a guest star or as a person coming on to a new show, and it can be overwhelming. What was your experience like? We've talked on the show about Kyle Chandler actually having that first night that you guys were in town. I think it was Kyle yeah. and Pete Berg, and we all went out to dinner. Yeah. Just talk about what your experience was like coming in as the new guy, because that's it can suck, man. I've been there. Uh, I mean, look, I had such deep admiration for all of you guys. This, you know, indescribable reverence mm -hmm. for the show. This job was so special. The work, the storytelling, every bit of the show, you know, visually, musically, like every bit of it resonated so deeply with me. All right. So I go and I audition for Linda Lowy. I get a call back. She gave me some notes. I kind of went in with an accent already. Everything about my involvement on the show, I can only describe it as like, from the minute I got the audition, I had this fever for the show. I felt the weight and the importance of the moment. I mm. felt the importance of like, what this opportunity was for me that I was blessed with, you know, just to audition as it kind of developed forward and eventually I got the job. I felt the weight and the responsibility 
of serving something that was so beautiful and so important to so many people, including myself. It was just immense sense of responsibility. So I kind of was always in this like, I don't want to say haze or like, you know, fever and haze or like such strong and intense words, but it was like this thing of like, I knew the importance of what it was. And I kind of got on that wave and kept riding it all the way through. I think I got my second call back was with Pete Berg and we're in this gigantic room and he's sitting at the other end of it. He's like, yeah, good, good. All right, well do this scene. It was a scene with Connie where she is principal Taylor has to break the news to my character, Luke, that he's not going to be playing for Dylan anymore because the fake address. And so he goes, just do the scene. And all you can say is, your address and i can't remember what the address is but let's say it's like 5587 oak lawn Drive. i can't remember what it is i'm gonna throw it out there i'm gonna guess but i think i might actually be right 2665 oak lawn lane or something or oak God, lawn drive or something nerds 20 26 i'm gonna have to look it up 80. now i thought there was an eight in there I, you I might heard. be you you might know i mean i oh. hope you know it <laughs> i don't like man. years ago <laughs> okay so all, all you can say the, was the address all i could yeah. say was the address and that's the only response i got no matter what she throws at oh me my God. he's like good he's like threaten her with it beg reason with her you know he's like all the things that i'm just like balling and giving it everything i've possibly got to get this woman to keep me you know on the team and then i'm like sitting there snotty and dripping and red face <laughs> and he and like about like it felt like 40 feet away from him you know he gets up in the dust and he walks right up to me he's a pretty big dude yeah and he like walks right up to me slowly and he looks me dead in the eye and he goes you an athlete and i go yes sir and he goes don't bullshit me man and i go yeah yes i am and he goes really are you an athlete and i said i'm the fastest athlete you ever saw or something like that i said 100 i used to be a sprinter when i was a kid he goes all right he just kind of turns and walks away oh my God. Yeah. and then the next phase and this is worth saying the next phase of the audition was a screen test and it was just all video stuff. And they had Becky's and they had Luke's that day. And because Becky was going to be dealing with Riggins as much mm-hmm. as she was, Taylor was there. And so I freaked out. This is my first time meeting one of you guys. And it's Riggins. He's a mythical creature, you know what I mean? <laughs> of like, of like tangly hair and <laughs> and uh, bulbous abs. It's every straight guy's first male crush, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so he was in there and he just stayed in there and i walked in i was like oh my god what's up dude i just go right to him shook his hand and he's like hey man and then they had me improv with him it was a blast and i left that audition i called my manager and i said i was near tears i said listen man i don't even care if i get the job i did care i said yeah. if i get the job it's icing on the cake but to have been able to be in the room with people Kadams, Pete, and then Taylor, to be in the room with the people that made this amazing thing, just a small part of it, to feel like I was able to go into that room. It meant so much to me to have been given a little bit of like, you know, like, hey, man, nice work from people that I admired well, like you so played much. played at their level. I had that same vibe when I got done with my audition for Friday Night Lights. A lot of times you leave and you're going, I don't know. And I was like, dude, that was fun man how often can you say you had an audition that was fun that you enjoyed like i mean just because there was so much play in the room it was like you do the scene but then you're going to do it a couple of times and then you're going to do it angry you're going to do it sad you're going to do it you know as you said pete's going to have you do it five or six different ways and after it was done i had like this i felt fulfilled artistically that's it it was artistically fulfilling and for someone who was such a great admirer of what Friday Night Lights was for me to be able to play in the game with them. It's yeah. like it's like playing a pickup game with your heroes. And you're just like, yeah. I was in there and I threw the layup to Michael Jordan and he stunked it. And I, you know, that was pretty cool. And you did, man. I mean, you did throughout the whole entire time on the show. I loved your storyline. You, you, Michael B. Journey, came in guns a blazing. And I was like, they've yeah, been did. here the whole time. Well, that first it was scene. Almost annoying. Your first big yeah. scene with you and Connie, the one that we were just talking about that you auditioned with. I mean, you broke down in that scene. You're crying on the side of the field when she's telling you that you're no longer going to be on the team. Mm-hmm. It was also beautifully shot. It's one of these things that Stacey and I talk mm-hmm. about all the time on this show. Mm-hmm. And that was one that I'm sure you guys didn't plan. I don't think that they planned on there being ready that day there just was and it just kind of no it was the first time i was putting on football gear and i'm in my trailer trying to figure i never played football i was trying to figure out where's this thing going (laughs) Uh, and and they're like we need you now and it's like i thought we they're like we got to go now and i was like oh because they were trying to beat the rain and then i was like oh oh oh." i'm like running out the door like trying to get my helmet on my head i did that thing where like you're not used to 
wearing a helmet and you like start walking into stuff and hitting door frames and stuff like yep. you're like oh you know and then i just like literally shot out of a can and throw me out there and it's starting to rain and that was that you know so the, you had brought up the dinner with kyle like i said i wanted so desperately to serve the show i felt yeah. such yeah. a burden of responsibility to not mess it up I think we and, all did, though. I'll be honest with you. I feel like there was that pressure anytime I had a scene, anytime Stacy had a scene. Not so much that you were like scared, but this, hey, man, I've got this wonderful opportunity. I just want to hit this out of the park. I remember talking to Michael B. Jordan. We were both staying at the Marriott Residence Inn in downtown Austin, like off of 4th Street or something. Yeah. And uh, they had us there for the first, like, I don't know, five episodes or something. It felt like a probationary period, which adds even more stress. <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't know They that. were like, we had been hired as like, you know main cast but you're gonna do five episodes before we pick up your option oh wow and, you know it's kind of like this thing of like you're under review is what it felt like yeah. and that's so that was very stressful but anyways we're just doing our thing the first day that mike gets to shoot there's a lot of like fittings and all the different things you do and the first day that mike shot before me and he does the scene where he's like running down an alley and we first see vince and he's you know getting in trouble with the law or whatever it is and that was his first day pretty high octane. I was stuff, on you know? set that day too, because right around the corner is where we shot Riggins Riggs. I was watching him run down that alleyway and I was like, oh, this good. guy's good. This guy's good. <laughs> and, my, and for you guys who don't know, Mike is fast, man. That guy yeah, is fast. Yeah, he is fast. fast. He comes back to the hotel and he's like just exploding, you know? And I'm like, what was it like? What happened? <laughs> tell me everything. What was that? Did you improvise? He goes, yeah, yeah. There was, we, we like improvised. We're like, well, tell me, what do you mean you improvise? Like what? And he goes, I don't know. You, and, and I was like trying to get like, what's the vibe? Do we play? What do we do? Like, you don't know anything. Yeah. yeah. And I'm calling every acting teacher I ever had being like, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm so scared. <laughs> you know, I, I had so many pep talks that first week and throughout, honestly. The fact that they had to call you to set to try and beat the rain and you didn't have time to get in your head too much. Oh, it's just God, like, so yeah, 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 you just kind of have to get thrown into the deep end. Because I know for me personally, as an actor, sometimes too much preparation can be death because mm -hmm. you think 100%. too much about it. And then yeah. you get there on the day and it's just not fresh anymore, you know? Yeah, you've, absolutely. You've overthought it. What would you say your favorite storyline on the show was? For my character, for any character. For your yeah. character. Oh, I mean, you had some good ones. I mean, all your stuff with Becky was great. The abortion yeah. one was obviously it's yeah, you know, practical I think and timely. That's a really special one. Yeah. You know, I've said this before, but I'll say to the cows come home. I had the great opportunity to attend like a gala. There's a thing called television with a conscience. It's this organization where they commend creatives or even, you know, talk shows, reality shows, anything that delves into something that, you know, I don't want to get it wrong what their mission is, but it says it all in the title, Television with a Conscience. And there was a lot of shows there that night that had done something so important to sort of move the culture forward and to educate and to maybe uplift. Anyway, Jason Kadams, the showrunner for Friday Night Lights and Parenthood, was being acknowledged twice that evening for work that he'd done. One was a storyline on Parenthood and then the abortion storyline on Friday Night Lights because they had dealt with such a common mm -hmm. and very challenging situation in such a nuanced and honest and complicated way with that yeah. abortion storyline. So I feel very proud to have been a part of something. I mean, look, you know, regardless of your personal or spiritual or political views, this is a thing that happens to kids all the time. Yeah. The highlight of the story really isn't about, I don't think, the decision that Becky no. makes as much as seeing two kids in a really tough situation that they're in over their heads and trying to navigate something that they don't have the life experience or maturity. You know, they're just barely hanging on, you know, and that was a very tricky and obviously it was played so beautifully by Dora Madison. And she did such a beautiful job on that. And actually, I remember some of the pivotal moments were directed by fantastic director, Alison yeah. Lee Brown. Yeah, she's um, Oh, Alison. Yeah, she's phenomenal. Anyways, yeah, that was a pretty special storyline, I would say. Stacy and I, in talking about that storyline, it's like, I don't want to offend anybody. That's not my objective on this show. But I do feel like me personally, I'm kind of like tiptoeing around even talking about the storyline. But I think that's what Friday Night Lights does so well is it humanizes the situation. I mean, you mm -hmm. pretty much nailed it in the way you were describing it. It puts a face to this issue mm -hmm. and it just presents the story.
doesn't tell you mm-hmm. what to believe, doesn't tell you how to yeah, think. Yeah, it doesn't push an agenda. It's this, yeah, it's not pushing happens. an agenda. It's not anyone getting on a soapbox. It's just saying, hey, this is yeah. something that happens. It happens on a regular basis in the United yeah. States and, in, and across the world. Yeah. And this is just the story of these two kids going through it and their families going through it. Maybe even worth saying, hey, we say calling it the abortion storyline. It should be calling it the teen pregnancy storyline. Yeah. There is an outcome, obviously, but it's more about two kids in a tough situation. And mm-hmm. there's no bow wrapped around it. Regardless of what yeah. decision is made at the end of the day, mm-hmm. it's never mm-hmm. easy, I don't think. I want to tell a couple of stories about Dora. Go for it. Uh, so Madison, Dora, Becky, <laughs> literally had just enrolled in college. She was a real deal teenager. Yeah. And had just graduated as a Hutto hippo. She's from a little town called Hutto. Their school mascot is the hippos, which... <laughs> There's no hippos anywhere near Texas. Let's, let's, just be, let's just be clear about that. So she graduated from high school, got so. this gig. And when you first start working on a television show, especially a network show, you guys know, there's you know table reads where you read through the scripts with the mucky mucks. There's fittings. There's dinners with your bosses. There's, you know, there's all these things you do at the very beginning. And one of those things is the sexual harassment seminar. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, yep. <laughs> there's HR the, meetings. To, the HR means make sure that, you know, because you're still working for a big corporation, make sure that everybody's, you know, maintaining a work environment that is comfortable for everybody and is respectful. So I'm driving her to this harassment meeting. She was she was like my little sister, honestly, in, in real life. Like we had this beautiful thing, romantic thing on screen, but she knew my wife. She was so much younger than us. And so she was like a little sister to me. I'm driving her to this thing. And at some point I realized that she's still enrolled in school. And I'm like, you know, you got to withdraw. And she's like, yeah. And I go, there's a point where if you go past that point, you can't withdraw from that semester and you're going to be in it to the teeth for those classes. And she's like, really? And I'm like, yeah, you, you got to do that like yesterday. <laughs> um, but she was just brand spanking new. And uh, she's just a beautiful person. Yeah. We loved working with her. Where do you think yeah. Luke and Becky are now? Boy, <laughs> I can tell you this. I know at least for a good 10 years following going separate ways at the end of the series i would say for at least 10 years she was it i mean i I can't imagine a small town her not being it for luke and him not always trying to knock on that door it's funny i walked into a store shout out to snake oil provisions in highland park who (laughs) they they're big friday night fans And, and and this is one of those funny symbiotic moments where i walk in the store and they're like we just finished watching friday night lights again last night and I go, do you think I made the catch? And he goes, of course you made the catch. <laughs> and, then, and then they started like going off. And I, I hadn't thought about this in a while. They started going off about, man, Luke got done so dirty, man. This guy was a real prospect. He didn't get any college looks. Like, you know, it was like they, they couldn't believe it. They're like, what world is that possible? They were so <laughs> upset for Luke yeah. that Luke never made it to a D1 school and ended up, you know, and look, that was obviously his mission was to go to the military. I think Luke never stopped holding the flame for Becky. And I think Luke probably ends up living in town and coaching and trying to do the right thing. Always oh, trying to I do the right thing. Luke being the yeah, next coach see. Taylor. I can see that. <laughs> All right, man. I'm going to close out the interview Big just by asking you what your favorite memory on set or your time on Friday Night Lights was. Just your, your favorite And time. I am just going to shoot out that maybe you remember you, me, and Jesse would go over to my mom Dana's house and play music all night. So <laughs> that's that happens. Hoot nannies. That is the thing, I think. That is the thing. The people were amazing. From you guys taking me out to like Buddy Garrity. Brad is <laughs> just a in, character. Brad is Buddy Garrity is Brad is Buddy Garrity. I remember Brad was like staying in the same hotel as me right at the very beginning. And I'm going in there trying to like somehow in, in a handful of weeks put on some muscle, you know, in the, in the, ho- in the hotel like gym. And Brad's there on the elliptical just sort of unapologetically unabashedly you know one of the most adored characters on friday night life and he's like businessman and all sorts of people in there working out and he's on the elliptical you know loudest can be just like oh here he comes here's one of the new characters right there luke cafferty he's, <laughs> he's from friday night and he's just he's just oh like this is on one of the elliptical. new guys on the show he you're gonna love him man he does all these things he's that's so good He's going to be dating know. this girl named Becky. He's going to have a fake address. Oh, it's going to be spectacular, man. Dude. Absolutely. I can imagine just sweating profusely on the elliptical. Oh, man. So, I love me some so, Brad Leland. You know, but that, that's the thing. You guys take me out. Brad right there in the thing. First person I met on set, I think, was Jesse Clemens. Just about fell through the floor. I was like, I can't <laughs> believe 
I'm talking to Landry and I'm like, dude, you are amazing in this show. I mean, I was just like, I gassed, you know? And to your point about the Hootenannies over at Dana's house, wonderful woman. That was what the experience was. You were never not in it. First of all, I was walking around. I was so in it because I was just, I just could not let it down. I could not like let the show down. I had my Texas accent 24 seven because I'm trying to like make sure I don't slip up when we're improvising. I bought myself a pair of shit kickers. I bought myself <laughs> another pair. I, you know, I was wearing like boot cut jeans all day, every day and pearl snap shirts, even in the summertime, like That's never so wore funny. shorts the whole time. I just thought that was you. No, yeah, that was no. you living in it. Look, I knew there was a lot of improvising and I just couldn't let it down. I just couldn't yeah. disappoint the show, you know, but that was what was the best part about it. Like Dylan, make no mistake, was a real community. Yeah. Dylan, Texas, this fantastical place was a real community. And it was from Taylor Kitsch the first time I was on set with him being like, hey, take my number. We'll go get a cheese wheel or whatever. Like, or him being like grease here's... wheel. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. He's like, he's like, here's where you get the best burgers in town. Yo, here's, here's the best, the best bar. Burger. Here's the best. He gave me the list of like everything from the beginning. And, you know, um, we got a shout out. Darren Damewood. He was our equipment manager. He had real deal contacts with Under Armour and all the companies oh, God, that, yeah. that did the jerseys and everything. And he had worked as an equipment manager, either at Texas or somewhere, like on a real mm -hmm. football team, the D1 football team, and knew how it worked. And all the coaches there who were real coaches and real athletes, yeah. and they wrapped our ankles every time, and they got us into the gear. Like, all of it was so real. It was a real living, breathing thing. And we were in a real crappy, dingy field house with locker rooms. Yeah. Like, that was a real football field. Really? There were no sets. There were real yeah. houses. Mm -hmm. So... When you were in Dylan, you were in Dylan and the bond between the other actors and all of the creatives, like everybody knew how special it was. So it's not one I mean, isolated even like the thing. casting it's, it's of the your dad, Barry Tubb, who's an actor, but Barry Tubb is also a cowboy. Yeah. Goodness me. Like he's yeah, a we call cowboy. Inappropriate Barry. Inappropriate Barry. <laughs> you know? But but yeah, I mean the kind of things of like we're going to Hoot Nanny at Dana's house, we're all playing music together, Jesse's plucking away, we're all singing harmonies, going to TCs and listening to music together. It was just like it was living in that community together and it was beautiful. Yeah, oh my god, you're making it. me super miss it right now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, super yep. miss it, man. I'm right there with you. Oh man, well, dude, thank you so much for taking the time. What an honor, guys. show today. I guys. really appreciate it, bud. I know how busy you are. I know you're working nonstop. Please give Michelle a big hug from all of us. I miss Michelle. <laughs> we'll all have to do it again. Yeah, yeah, man. Anytime. That is going to be it for Season 5, Episode 7. But join us next time for Season 5, Episode 8, titled Fracture. But until then, clear eyes. Full hearts can't lose. Clear Eyes Full Hearts is a podcast presentation of Black Bear Media and Ritual Productions. Executive producers are Stacey Rastano and Derek Phillips, Chris and Mindy Wimmer for Black Bear Media, and Steve Walters for Ritual Productions. Our producer is Miranda Parham. Send your questions to Clear Eyes Full Hearts Pod at gmail.com. And follow us on social media. I'm on Instagram at Stacey Orstano. And I'm also on Instagram at underscore Derek Phillips. Check us out on YouTube and BlackBarrelMedia.com. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.